Hello, I'm Tony Giddens, director of the Washington DC International Film Festival. In this year's festival, we have an exciting new drama called Charlatan. It's from the Czech Republic and the director of the film, Aneshka Holland, is with us today for a conversation with Aviva Kempner. Aviva, a friend of Anishka's and Aviva award-winning filmmaker in her own right, uh, will be talking to Aneshka about what it took to make this film, why she decided to do this script as opposed to the many others available to her. I hope you will enjoy this conversation. Uh, it should be interesting, inviting, and no doubt in depth. Take care, hope to see you at the movies. So I'm sitting here in Washington, DC, excited for Film Fest DC to start. And Tony Giddings has scored again by having Aneshka Holland's new film, Charlatan, at the festival that opens in July. But we in Washington get to see it before and to have her have a conversation with us. It's especially important to me because Aneshka and I've been friends since 1990 when we were at a festival together in Moscow. I've admired her work. I have to say she even does more films about World War II than I do. She's an Oscar nominated for her script for Europa Europa for her film, Angry Harvest. She's the head of the European uh, film, um, what's it called, Aneshka? The European yeah. film. European Film Academy. Right. And what's interesting for her, even though she is Polish born, this is actually the second film that she's going to be making that she's made that has to do with Czech history. The other one uh, had to do with the student protest, um, the burning bush. So can you tell us, even though you're originally from Poland, what the Czech background is? Because I know that's impacted so much on your filmmaking. Um, I was uh, 17 when I um, went to Prague to study film in the famous um, Czech film school uh, FAMU, uh, where Milos Forman uh, was, um, um, was um, um, graduating from, and Vera Hetilova, Jan Niemiec, and many, many, Izzy Menzel, many great um, directors of 20th century. And uh, the school was very interesting, but what was even more interesting, it was the time I, I, I began my studies and it was in 67. In 68, it was a Prague Spring, the very strong attempt of the democratization of communist regime, which was crushed by uh, Soviet tanks and the tanks of the Warsaw Pact. It means East German, Polish, Bulgarian, and so on. Uh, and um, the while after this um, intervention, the Czechoslovak society tried to fight for preserving the freedoms which was achieved during the Prague Spring, but after some attempt they resigned. One of the tragic attempts was the emulation to death of, of young student Jan Palak, um, who is a hero somehow of my miniseries Burning Bush. I did a few years ago. And, um, and after, you know, I was, I was in the student movement, I finished um, to be imprisoned, have a political trial to be, to be sentenced to some, uh, some prison which was suspended actually, but it was a great, for me, it was like formative years on all levels. I started to make my first student films. I discover the new culture and the new literature and the political life and the weakness of the people who've been easy to compromise when it came to their, you know, to their lives and to their, to their like well-being. And also I, I, I married my husband there. You know, it was many, many things which happened, which happened during these five years. I was in Czechoslovakia and it was engraved in my, knowledge of the world and of if my way of seeing uh, the people and the, you know the, the the mechanisms of the history and politics so when i received the offer to do burning bush it was for me like an incredible gift it was one of the most personal works somehow because i was talking about my 
very important experience. Uh, and after um, finishing Burning Bush, uh, which was very happy uh, shooting experience as well, as a crew were great and actors and everybody, it was great collaboration. One of the most, um, most like fulfilling I, I had in, in, in all my career. So when I received the script of The Charlatan, which was pretty close to the final script, we've been working on that with the writer uh, for several years, but um, uh, the script was already very intriguing and um, asking many questions, which have been for me uh, important questions, which I touched somehow in my previous movies. Uh, and in the same time, it was different. And it was also very different from uh, the film Mr. Jones I shot just before, which is also a historical film and also dealing somehow with the uh, totalitarian regimes, but um, it was much more um, activist film, much more openly political, um, speaking to the relevant issues um, of our modernity, of our times. Uh, and Charlatan, I think it's more timeless somehow, it's more mysterious, it's more universal, it is more about the human soul and the and the greatness and weakness of human soul and the power of the nature. And in the same time, the cowardice of the man to accept his own nature. So it's many, many questions <coughs> which can be interpreted in, 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 in various way, in different way, because um, the movie is quite open. It doesn't say you what you have to think. You have to make your homework to come with the with the conclusions. What is right? What is wrong? Who is a hero? Who is a coward? And what is important in the life? What's interesting, though, is I understand that when you first were presented the script, you had obligations with other movies and you didn't do it right away. But it turned out to be a good casting. It helped in the casting. You want to talk about casting the young uh, healer and the old, older healer. I think it's one of the most fascinating stories of casting. Actually, I'm pretty sure, uh, I was pretty sure pretty soon that I would like uh, Ivan Trojan, who is famous, um, um, probably the most famous actor of his generation and who I collaborated with on the burning bush. Uh, and um, Ivan has the depth and the, you know, courage and in the same time, the the inner sensibility, which you know, which which was very interesting for this role. I still did some casting, um, trying another actors, just to be sure that I'm not so much uh, in love with Ivan that I'm not that I'm neglecting another possibilities. Uh, but finally, yes, it was four years uh, before we started the actual production. Uh, when we cast it Ivan, and because the story happens over um, uh, 40 years of Mikolaszek uh, uh, life, uh, we knew that it will be possible for Ivan, for the, you know, for the main actor to play Mikolaszek in 40, 50 and 60. And it was possible with the wonderful help of the um, great Czech makeup artists. Uh, but I knew also that it will be, he will be unable to play 20 years old. Um, he's uh, the young Mikolaszek. Uh, and we've been trying different actors and um, I knew that Ivan has four sons. And that, but I didn't know that his second son looks so much like him and wants to be an actor. And um, when we started, uh, the boy was 14 years old, and um, in the story he's about 20, uh, so we even didn't consider him. But when we finally have been ready to start, he was 18, and he presented himself um, without telling his father uh, to the casting director, telling that he would love to, to play his father young, and maybe he will be good for that. Uh, so um, I they, they they made the test without me seeing whatever, and after when they sent me the link, I was like amazed because he's not only like physically his physical resemblance, but it's some kind of the 
inner resemblance, the, the way he's moving, he's, you know, reacting is something, he, he's like, he's really, he has very much of his father on all possible levels. And he's also naturally talented um, young actor with a lot of courage and, um, and, and very responsible and hardworking to prepare. So, you know, it was this luck which directors sometimes have that finally, you know, I was looking far away and uh, just under the lantern, uh, it was the right, uh, the right uh, actor to play uh, young uh, Jan Mikolaszek. And has he gone on to do some acting? Do you know? Have you kept in touch with him? Has he gone on to do some acting? He played in some uh, short films and in one series, and he's he's seriously preparing himself uh, to be an, a serious actor. I'm I'm pretty sure. And he is very willful, you know. He, if he plans something and wants something, he will do it. Uh, also on this level, he's very much like his his father. And in the same time, he's very young, you know, very young man. Today he's about 20, 19, 20. Uh, and you know, and he has all the life ahead of him, and he looks great and uh, has fantastic charisma. So we are we are even talking um, about. Um, making together the movie about Franz Kafka ah. uh, with him playing young Kafka. But yeah, we, we are still like working on the idea, but anyway, he can do it. So let me talk to you because I, what I didn't mention in the intro that you've done so much also American TV, like you directed a series of The Wire House of Cards and Treme and uh, Secret Garden. So you direct in English in Polish and Czech I mean, how is it, I mean, obviously you know those languages and I guess you know French too, but how is it to direct actors in different languages and different stories? Mm, the most difficult it was to direct the actors in German because I did two German movies, Europa, Europa and Angry Harvest. And I don't speak German actually. And then the actors didn't speak very good English neither. So that it was very intuitive kind of the, you know, of the relationship. When I did Angry Harvest, which the main role was played by Armin Millerstahl. Yes. Um, and, uh, and his English in this time was pretty weak, but I, you know, somehow I think you can communicate with the people uh, beyond the words. Of course, I, we had the translator and very good one to, uh, to translate what I was talking, but, and to what he talked to me, but, uh, but the, this communication, this connection was was like nonverbal also. And I think that directing, it, it not necessarily means that you have to do the long analysis and to and to speak a lot. It, it, it's the trust is built in between the words somehow, you know. What is really important is to look at your actor, to really watch him or her and to give um, the trust and the strength to him that he knows or she knows that, um, that I'm watching, that I, I will tell if something goes wrong or I will catch him if he is falling. Um, of course, it's much easier to, to direct in, in, in Polish or in Czech, they are my best languages probably, that Polish for sure. Uh, but you know, I with the actors, it was not a problem. It was not a problem at all. So let's go back to the movie. You know, we have it spanning the time of the wars and communism, but how true is the script? I mean, I know it's not a documentary, but in, how parallel is the story of the healer in, in this version of the film? Mikolaszek was very famous when he was alive and when he was active. And um, I think that millions of people in Czechoslovakia knew about him. And he was helping really millions of people somehow. Uh, but when he was um, arrested and after a sentence and after he died, he was forgotten. It means um, I never heard about him when I was in, in Czechoslovakia. And so when I was reading the script for the first time, I had the impression that I'm reading a fictional story. It was so well composed and so, you know, so uh, it didn't have anything of the like regular classical biopic where you go chronologically from point A to point B and give some official story about the character. Here, um, 
uh, here the character was not um, so very well known and it was not a lot of the uh, documentary material or the documents and letters and, and so about him. We got everything which was possible and we tried to make it as accurate as possible. But um, and in terms of his medical activity, in, in of his healing activity, we are like 95%, you know, right. It means it, it how it looks like and it what he achieved. And it was what was his gift, his special like intuitive way, you know, to, to, to detecting the sickness and to finding the innovating combination of herbs to heal. Uh, in terms of his story life, um, for example, his story with Gestapo, it is accurate as well. Uh, the, his um, uh, his uh, battle with the, with the communist regime is pretty accurate, but we dramatize it a bit. And what concerns his private life and his inner in our life, we had to let work our imagination. Uh, it came, it was inspired by some witnesses or some like uh, uh, little writing somehow, some place, some photos and so, uh, but of course we don't know. He, he left only one official autobiography, which is um, very, you know, how to say, uh, auto, auto prizing he like presented himself as a sweet and always gentle and always right man interesting so why do you think uh the communists arrested him because he made too much money they didn't believe in his medicine you know his treatments well, he did believe in his treatment because he was he was treating successfully the communist president of the country, Antonin Zapotocki, who came out from the uh, from the uh, Nazi concentration camp and was on the bar, um, on the board um, of of dying uh, or at least to be amputated, uh, amputated, uh, and he helped him and he kept him in good shape for. Uh, over 10 years. So uh, he also was helping another ministers and, you know, officials of the communist regime. But some um, important, especially KGB members of this regime have been very angry that he is behaving in such an independent way. Czechoslovakia was um, uh, much more than Poland, for example, um, uh, collectivized. It means that private property practically didn't exist. The, the people didn't have the employers. They've been, you know, it was like all some kind of the collective, you know, uh, collective uh, gray life. And he was like the colorful independent bird with his villa and his private hospital and with big American car and his employers and the money he was doing in the way which was, which was not like so official by selling the herbs and so on. And they wanted really, you know, to punish him and to add, to destroy him. Uh, he was a bad example to everybody, uh, but, uh, but he had the cover as long as, um, as uh, president was alive. Right. So immediately after president died, the secret police jumped on him and created some kind of the provocation to, to, uh, to punish him. And how long was he in prison? You know, the, the totalitarian totalitarian regime hates the people who are independent from them. That is, even in authoritarian regime, hate the people who are not afraid of them. Unfortunately, that is some kind of the general truth. Some of those regimes are more cruel, like Stalinian regime, and some are more soft like, you know, the, I don't know, Polish regime in 70s, but, uh, but they hate independence and difference. Right. Uh, apropos Stalin regime, I'm just hoping people who have seen this movie um, this week, and it's the first week of the film festival, also go back and right away see the movie that you completed before, Mr. Jones. I mean, it is one of the most heart-wrenching movie I've seen, especially about a journalist trying to expose the truth. Can you just talk about it for a couple of minutes? Because um, it was just magnificent, Aneshka. 
Well, it's important to me, but like practically all last, all films probably like this are important to me, but this one I found really relevant. If it's speaking about, you know, about the fact checking, about the role of the journalism to report the truth, about the price the journalist is paying for that, about the corruption of the media, the cowardice of the governments and the indifference of the people. And when this triad is coming together, anything is possible. Because I think without courageous investigative journalists, the democracy cannot survive. And um, I and and you know, and the 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 the, the populist or authoritarian regimes are using the propaganda and fake news and alternative realities as a very important tool, especially today with the with the social media. But in thirties, when social media didn't exist, they, it was efficient um, in Stalinian or, or Nazi propaganda as well. And we can see very clearly uh, where we are heading if we will be not careful. So this film is the homage to the courage of the of the of the journalism, but in the same time the warning: what will happen if the media will stop to report the truth? And Mr. Jones is a story of uh, a Western journalist who's perpetuating part of the lie, but I don't want to spoil the movie. So let's also go back to... Yeah, it's a story of Welsh journalists going to Soviet Russia and discovering, you know, the terrible tragedy in Ukraine caused by Stalin's politics. Right. Um, so let's go back both with Mr. Jones, but certainly the movie that people are seeing here at the festival, your visual style, your use of, uh, usually it's always Eastern European DPs. Uh, there's always such a, the scenes are just so beautifully shot and create a mood. You wanna talk a little bit uh, what your signature is as a director and how you work with your directors of photography? We are working very closely, and of course, I am choosing the directors of, cinemat of, of cinematography wow. who, are, who have similar sensibility and some openness to, to my search. Because every time when I start the movie, I am searching for the right style for the story. It means uh, I'm not a conceptual uh, person. I don't like to know exactly how I will shoot. I'm open to take the inspiration from the reality of the scenes, from the actors, from the sets, from the light. But of course, we have some general concept when we are starting, inspired also by the iconography, by the, you know, the films we are watching together, the photographs, the paintings. Uh, but the most important is what's coming from the reality of the story. So we are looking like, you know, how to find the way to express the story in the most personal and most sensual and most relevant way. So that is my, you know, every time it's, it's a search. Of course, when you watch my movies, you see some similarities and some fascinations for some visuals like reflections or, or you know, some kind of the camera movements. But in general, every film has slightly different style and, uh, it is not because I try to be different every time, but because the story, different story asks for different language. Right. So in conclusion, what's the next Ineska Holland movie that we can look forward to? What's, what's in the pipeline? Well, I don't know. I don't know. The pandemic stopped me a bit in my run. I was supposed to do the new TV series for Apple TV shot in Paris during last year but it was canceled because of the, of the, of the situation. And um, I, I thought that during this time I will write the, write the script, but I have only some sketches and notes so far. So I hope it will, something will, will finalize. Uh, and I would like to do something contemporary, something which is, touchy, that is touching the underneath of our fears. Uh, and, um, and, you know, we will see, we will see. Uh, I'm reading some scripts which are which are quite interesting. So maybe before writing my own, which will be maybe my last film, who knows? I will do some another another difficult to tell. I don't certainly. I think we are living in such a complicated times 
that I don't want to do whatever, you know. I, I would like to focus on something which may, may be important to me and hopefully to the audience. Well, I know you, like myself, are always involved in contemporary politics and there's an issue of women losing the right to abortion in Poland, just like there may be some legal cases coming up. So would that be a possibility? I know you were involved in demonstrations about it in Poland. Well, it doesn't look very hopeful, the situation, but I hope that, you know, in one moment, the youth will take over. Uh, it's a lot of resignation, it's a lot of cynicism, uh, and it's a lot of, you know, of the real danger of some kind of the right-wing, um, nationalistic, um, close to fascistic, you know, pulsions. Uh, but in the same time, the youth, especially young women, uh, seems to be immune on the official propaganda and they seem to organize around um, around some some new new issues so i'm pessimistic and optimistic in the same time but my role is not to judge my role is to help and to eventually to 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 ring the bell when i see that something is really bad and just one last question do you think we'll get people to audiences to go back to the movie theaters well i hope so uh, because I think we are all tired of the loneliness, but it's, it is a real danger that the younger generation uh, got so used to the virtual communication and to the virtual world that somehow it is difficult for them to leave their own room and uh, unglue their eyes from the computer screen. So um, we, we can win or we can lose as a, as a theatrical cinema. It means only like really lively cinema for me. Uh, but it depends very much on the movies we are doing. It means we have to make the movies so courageous, so original and so personal that the people will, will have the reason to, you know, to go out. Okay, thank you so much. And we're looking forward to many more Ineska Holland films. Thank you, Aviva. It's a pleasure to talk to you, you know.